we had this part of the beach. Yeah, we had the short end of the stick. This was the toughest beach. That's why I tell all people when you go up to the cemetery, walk to the English Channel and take a look out. I hope you're there at low tide so you can see what these guys had to come across. The reason why both of us are here today is because someone took a hit for us. The 400,000 Americans who gave their lives for this, they are the reason that all of us, I don't care where you come from, are here and have the success and peace and freedom we have now. You have to give it to that generation. I want you all to remember that because we're not going to be around for a long time and you have to protect this world. We did it once and it's your responsibility to keep going. Welcome to Glorious Professionals brought to you by GORUCK Media. I'm Jason here with Emily, Rich, and Sergeant Major Plants, AKA Cadre Dan. The words I read to kick this off are spoken by a self-proclaimed loud and fast-talking veteran, a spry 99-year-old who served in the 29th Division. In 2019, he made a group of GORUCK participants in Normandy laugh and cry as he recounted his experiences as part of the first wave onto Omaha Beach. As part of the GORUCK Tribe Book Club, we read and rewatched Band of Brothers by Stephen Ambrose. Today, we've gathered around to talk about the stories from that remarkable book and TV series, as well as our own experiences in Normandy, a place I think of as the most American place on planet Earth. Dan has designed and led a bunch of GORUCK events in Normandy over the years. Richard Rice, who as always brings his immense historical perspective, having served in several wars during his long and storied career. Hey, Rich, um, how many weeks did you miss the Normandy landings by again? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> and Emily, of course, who rocked the 75 kilometers from Utah Beach to Omaha Beach with me in 2019. It's my favorite Go Ruck event of all time. So, Dan, welcome. I can't believe this is the first time we've had you on. I know. Like, uh, I was starting to think uh, I was maybe forgotten or something like that. <laughs> but uh, the first time to come on this podcast to talk about Normandy, that that's perfect. That's exactly the way I should enter, enter into the the Glorious Professionals podcast. All right. Before we get into any details, it's hard to lead GORUCK events. You're responsible for a lot. There's a lot on your shoulders, the success of the class. When you go to a place like Normandy, I mean, it is, I, I, I've, I have goosebumps right now looking at a map of the invasion. I got goosebumps running down my spine into my fingers, tingling. I mean, how do you, how do you take that on? So I think it's, it, it's two things. So the first thing is, is that I was a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division. And the 82nd Airborne Division, of course, uh, was one of the units who participated in D-Day. So growing up the first five years of my military career being in the 82nd, you learn and it's beat into your head what these guys did on D-Day. So you have like a real great appreciation uh, for the legacy of that stored division and, of course, appreciation for for what those guys did on D-Day. You're just, you're constantly taught and constantly reminded uh, of the things that those guys do. I mean, you go on to Fort Bragg, you know, especially around where the 82nd Airborne Division is. I mean, a lot of the streets are named after guys that, you know, served in um, World War II during, uh in the 82nd. And you can see some of the Medal of Honor names. And, and it, it's just like, it, it's a constant reminder of, of what those guys did on D-Day. And then part two, it, it's just have having the, the motivation to, to make sure that, you run a particularly awesome event on storied ground. I, I, I took a simple approach. I'm a very basic man. I just picked up a book. Particularly, I've read uh, I've read a couple Stephen Ambrose's book D Day, and I've read that multiple times just to make sure that I understood everything that happened. And Stephen Ambrose does a phenomenal job on breaking down D Day from building up at a macro level of what happened, uh, how we even got there, to you know the actions on. And then a little bit um, afterwards. And then I, I caught another book too, uh, Dawn of D-Day by um, Stephen Harvath. And um, that was another outstanding book that I read um, that really gave some context. So it, it, as far as like running, running a go ruck event on the beaches in Normandy, my number one goal, and, and I say this whether it was on the Normandy beaches or whether you know, the other events I've ran stateside, I, I want the participants to walk away with a really good understanding of what happened on D-Day so that if somebody asks them, hey, you, what do you know about D-Day? They can give like a, a two to three minute like spiel on like, hey, this is, this is how D-Day was. And, you know, for, for the participants to walk away 
you know, physically challenged. Yeah, that, I definitely want to do that, but that's not necessarily the focus. The focus is on making sure that the folks understand um, the sacrifice that those men made on those beaches, you know, Utah and Omaha on the American side, and then in the drop zones on the continent peninsula. So as you look at those beaches and when you go there, and it's as our initial quote talked about, you know, I hope you see this at low tide so you can see. Yeah. When you stand up there, I have this image of you along the Atlantic wall when we were there a couple of years ago, and you're, you're giving a class on sectors of fire from a, yeah. from a fortified position that the Germans had spent years creating. Yeah. Specifically designed to just pick off anybody that would be coming with, with crew served weapons. How do you approach this tactically? Like how, what are, what are the tactics? Cause I've, I've seen you give this class there. It's great. It, it speaks to people like me with, with some experience and it speaks to people that have no experience. I mean, how do you portray the gravity? I mean, realize someone is listening to this right now. They don't have a map. They're not. It's like, how do you portray that though to somebody who hasn't been there yet? So the, specifically like the obstacles on the beach, they, they, they were lined up in, in, in different waves, right? You had outside at, at, at low tide line, you had like, you know, you had your telephone poles that were stuck into the, into the sand and they were facing out to the water and they had mines on those. And then you had, you know, some Belgian gates, that, the steel wire out there in, in the, in the water. And then you had like coming in, you had the hedgehogs, you know, the, the hedgehogs that like went pretty much anybody that ever seen anything on D-Day can, can see these, these uh, steel eye beams that are, they're well together and be like, that's a hedgehog. Okay. And then you got the mines on the beach. Um, then you got the barbed wire, the, the different layers of barbed wire on the beach. And that, that's just on the beach. And then you get, you get up into the high ground, you get up on the, the dunes of the beach, and then you get up in, into the bluffs, uh, specifically on Omaha Beach. Now you're talking gun emplacements where you got, you know, you got your artillery guns, you got your, you know, your, your fighting positions. And you, you just break it down to like, hey, this, this is, this is everything, you know, at a macro level that these guys had to face. And as far as the tactics on, on how to tackle that beach, uh, the planners specifically had to send out recon teams to figure out what was on the beach. And then they had to just kind of break it down like, okay, this first wave of engineers, you guys are going to blow through these obstacles so we can get the landing craft in. So the landing craft can land on the beach. So that the soldiers that are in the landing craft can get off the beach so that they can go ahead and storm the beaches so they can go ahead and take down the machine gun, machine gun nets and all the artillery pieces so that we can continue to get more and more waves on there. But the, the way the Germans had the, the the fighting positions on there, I mean, it, it really was a, it, it was it was a wall. It was an Atlantic wall. I mean, they they had pretty much every inch of that beach covered with machine gun fire, with artillery fire, with mortars. There wasn't a piece on that beach that wasn't like already sectored in with some type of weapon system to kill you when you came on that beach. Every square inch it is phenomenal job by the Germans on trying to. Uh, protect that beach uh, in their interests. Dan, I remember being there, you know, in that position and having you talk about this. And, you know, it's one thing to read about something like that. It's a whole nother thing to actually low crawl at low yeah. tide, you know, 300 yeah. yards of beach, you know, where there's yeah. very, very little cover, like one tiny little rock, <laughs> you know, that was the, the, the collection point for, for casualties. And I remember you telling us, you know, for every 85 yards of sand, there was a German machine gun with interlocking yeah. fire. And, you know, yeah. I had to learn what interlocking fire meant that day. But it, once you <laughs> figure it out, it, it scares the shit out of you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you wonder how anybody was able to actually get, you know, off that beach alive. Yeah. No, I mean, with the... Uh... The Germans with the interlocking fields of fire that they had on the beaches, you know, when when the uh, the folks got off the landing craft. I mean, there's if you if you watch uh, perfect examples if you watch the movie Saving Private Ryan, right? So you got the Higgins boat coming in, right? And you know you, you got the coxswain that's driving the boat. He's coming in. He's like, all right, ten seconds, ramp's going to drop, right? And you got the guys. They're all they're all pumped up. You can hear all the explosions and everything. And uh, the ramp drops and immediately, like that's a fatal funnel. That German machine gunner is trained on that 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 Higgins boat, and it's just an easy point of reference, an easy aim point for him just to lay, you know, machine gun fire into that boat. In in the movie Saving Private Ryan, it looked like half the boat got slaughtered, 
before they, they didn't even make it to the beach. And then, you know, the folks had to go over the sides, water's deep, you know, some of them drowned, some were able to swim, you know, get rid of their equipment. And, and then that's when the real fighting starts when you get onto the beach. And they had to fight for every inch of that beach uh, in order to take out the Germans. Hey, so let me give just a little context on the Atlantic Wall. Mm-hmm. So as you look at a map, it goes from the, the south of France along the, you know, the English Channel Atlantic side all the way up north through Denmark. And then it goes all the way up north through Norway as well, along the the western side of of Norway. So Hitler issued the order to build the Atlantic Wall on March 23rd, 1942, and is now famous Directive 40. The plan called for the construction of 15,000 separate concrete emplacements to be manned by 300,000 soldiers, both German troops and foreign conscripts. Since no one in the Axis High Command knew where the invasion would occur, the whole of occupied Europe's Atlantic coastline was to be fortified. Astoundingly, Hitler wanted the work to be completed by May 1st, 1943. So a couple other fun little tidbits. So a a 2,000 mile long chain of fortresses, gun emplacements, tank traps, and obstacles that became known as the Atlantic Wall. It took 260,000 workers to help build it. Only 10% were German. Approximately 1.2 million tons of steel went into the Atlantic Wall. That's enough to build more than 20,000 Tiger tanks. The Nazis also poured 17 million cubic meters of concrete into the defenses, the equivalent of 1,100 Yankee stadiums. And the the cost to lay down just the French portion of the Atlantic Wall was 3.7 billion Reichsmarks. That's about 206 billion in today's currency. And by the summer of 1944, the Nazis had laid more than 5 million mines along the Atlantic Wall. So you've got multi-years. And interestingly enough, though, you had General Rommel, the best general on the German side, who toured it and described it as lunacy. Yeah. And, and so, you know, although it was, it was one of the most impressive engineering feats of modern times, literally, British, American, and Canadian troops breached the seemingly impregnable Nazi defenses along an 80-mile stretch of French coastline at Normandy in a single day, June 6, 1944. I mean, how? Like, and I mean, I, I, I was, you know, reading. Goosebumps. Reading, you know? yeah. reading and it was yeah. just like talking about how the German leadership, the mid-level uh, leadership was so bad. I don't yeah. know if that had a big part of it, but. In uh, Donna, Donna D-Day, the, the author makes a great point, and, and he talks about how, you know, the generals and the planners, the staffs, they, they got the guys to D-Day, the, to the point where they got on the beach. And then from then on, it was, uh, you know, the soldiers, the non-commissioned officers, and the junior officers that, that stepped up and fought. That's the how. The how is the fighting man, mm-hmm. you know, the soldier that's empowered to make decisions on the ground immediately. And luckily for us on our side, we had plenty of folks that that took charge of a really, really, really bad situation and were able to, you know, crack the Atlantic wall. And and, and that to me is the how. It's it's the guy that's on the ground. Amen. So I'll go back in time a little bit. So I visited in 2002 and I was there with my aunt and I didn't really know what to expect. I knew I should go visit Normandy. Mm -hmm. I'll go check it out. Rented a car from Paris and went up and and stuff like that. And we were at one of the museums because I was in European travel mode, which means you go to, you go to museums, yeah, you look at yeah. cathedrals <laughs> and old stuff yeah. all the time. Right. I'm like, okay, this is, it kind of got lumped in a little bit. I knew it was special, but it kind of got lumped in. And I was, I found myself at one of the museums, I think it was at Utah and I was l- going through this and it's sort of one of those kind of like a snake, right. Museum where you're just, you're, you're just kind of ferried through along a set path. Like you're waiting in line at TSA or something, right? Except obviously the subject matter is a little bit different, yeah. but that's how museums can feel. And so that's like the bias that you bring. And I kept reading this and eventually it kind of got to me I'm like, wait, what? Wait, all of this years of the Atlantic wall. And then we're just going to what? And realize, you know, I'd grown up and th- this idea of kind of sacrifice and stuff. It was new to me watching post nine 11 and stuff. And it, it was one of those moments where I started to look around I'm like, is anybody else reading this? Like I just discovered something <laughs> crazy that the world should also discover. Yeah. And there was this man that was there and he, he had a, I, I didn't know any of the symbols or any of the unit stuff, but he had, you know, it was a U.S. veteran with a military style hat on, right? Might've said World War II veteran. I don't know. 
he kind of hinted at me like, Hey, do you have any questions? I'm like, well, yeah, actually I do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, so Hitler had years to build this up and our plan was to come in and, and attack that. That doesn't sound very like, wh what was the plan after he just started killing everybody? right? That, that stormed the beaches. And the guy looked at me very matter of fact, he's like, the plan was to send more bodies. Yeah. And, and as I think about how our generation, Dan fought wars, that, that is basically never happened. I mean, it's happened in no. very, very small direct orders, like attack this or attack that, but a campaign of this size, it's a different way to fight a war. And so I'm wondering, yeah. Rich, since you, you missed these, uh, this invasion by <laughs> weeks, <laughs> like how do how do you bridge oh. this? But, but all seriously, you know, I mean, how do you bridge this going back to that generation to now? And how do we make sense of this? I'll go back to something that Dan said a little earlier. And that is one thing that the American soldier has always been known for. And there's a bunch of reasons for this. It's because he trains so hard. He attends so many exercises that all of a sudden the actions that he has to take in combat become an automatic reflex, if you will. That pushes even beyond when leaders are eliminated or killed in combat. There's someone else close to them that has trained with them, that has been through those things. They may not be the same rank. Doesn't matter. When it gets into combat, there is no rank. I mean, there's guys yelling at you, telling you what to do, and you, you kind of take orders from it. And the American soldier has always been known to step up when his comrades fall and continue the mission. Uh, you know, one of the things from Vietnam was break contact, continue mission. No, these guys didn't break contact. They continued contact and continued mission. R right, so break contact means... Re essentially not retreat, but go backwards, go or, away from the, yeah. away from contact means gunfire. Yeah. Or, or move to the yeah. side, uh, step out of the interlocking fields of fire of the machine guns that are all tied together that, that have the beach totally covered. This was a different kind of war. It was an entirely different kind of war. They had tasted it somewhat in Africa. They had tasted it somewhat in, in Sicily and in Anzio in Italy, mm -hmm. but this was even to a greater extent. And one of the things that amazed me is, as I studied and read about uh, D-Day, and I, I've read the books that Dan said, uh, uh, Cornelius Ryan, The Longest Day, yeah. was, was a, a, like a Bible uh, at, when I was at one point in my life. It was just amazing to read the exploits of these people and, and how they persevered in the face of their own death. They knew. A lot of them just assumed they were going to die but it was a cause that needed to be followed, that needed to be pushed. And so they pushed it. And the leaders understood that against that wall, the, the Atlantic wall, there was nothing they could do except push and continue to push people against it, to continue to push explosives, artillery, naval gunfire, whatever it might be against that, and push people. You, you hear this in the book of Band of Brothers, and then you see it in the, the, the show as well, where, I mean, they trained for months. I mean, it was 22 months of training to get up to D-Day. Oh, yeah. And, in, in some yeah. cases, oh, years. The, yeah. the guys that went through yeah. TACOA, the 506 mm -hmm. Easy Company, they went through years of training and preparation. Yeah. They didn't know exactly what for. Right. They just knew that they were getting ready to go defend America. Yeah. That's actually what I was thinking about. I mean, you see when they're they're about to jump out of their planes or they're jumping out of their planes and, you know, the plane next to them just gets completely blown up. It's everyone is trained for years. And I mean, it just, life has risk. You, you're you never going to make sense of why this plane and not that plane. They're all trained basically equally and they're all just sent out. And it's literally from the general seat. It's a percentages game. It's what Dan was talking about. You've got to send the first wave in to take a little bit. And then the next wave takes a little bit more. And, and they try to find ways to ameliorate that. One of the things that a lot of the airplanes did as they approached Normandy, everybody stood up and hooked up. In the event that an airplane get started to get shot down and, and took fire and, and they knew it was going to crash, they could at least get out of the airplane if they were standing yeah. up. If they were sitting yeah. down, they wouldn't be able to do that. 
I, I love the detail in, in the book about how right before they were headed in, the Brits were like, hey, you got to put all these things, um, these sacks on your, your legs and put all this stuff in them. And oh, by the way, here's an air sickness pill. <laughs> <laughs> drugged these folks and they were, you know, like, you know, so sleepy and, and, you know, and it's, it's kind of so bizarre. Thanks, Brits. You know, they're, it's they're like, all taking Dramamine and falling asleep. Yeah. They're all falling asleep. And, and then of course the jump, you know, they had the dress rehearsal for the jump where they lost a lot of men and just in the dress rehearsal. And, you know, their only consolation from that, <laughs> this is directly from the book, they said, well, a bad dress rehearsal means a better, a good luck for the the real thing. That was that was how they handled it at the time. I mean, it I'm was, not sure whoever came up with that. I, it yeah. seems it seems a little funny, but you know, you've got these well trained soldiers. They're ready. They've been doing this for months. They they've been you know canceled on their jump, and now it's finally time to go. And then Murphy strikes <laughs> all the time, and then you see the, the parachute landing goes awry. You know, they're in these flooded fields. There are not, no one hits their DZ. They're all spread out everywhere. They're trying to figure out who's who at the zoo, you know, in the middle of the dark in Normandy. And, you know, Dan, that brings a point up to, you know, you've led so many events there. I remember before the big 75th anniversary, you came back, you're like, all right, here's the deal. We're doing all these events in the daytime. <laughs> Because, yeah. because it is dark out there. <laughs> yeah, 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 it really is. We went over there. We ran HTO in uh, 2015. Uh, we started at Omaha Beach. And in uh, and, and just the time we started, I mean, it just started getting dark. We, you know, we marched down kind of like opposite of the route of the, of the uh, 75K. So we marched down and then, you know, uh, around the, uh, the, the river and then, you know, up through Carrington. And then uh, through the drop zones up to the Ferrer Bridge, St. Mary Glees, and then up uh, up to the Utah Beach. And it, it, it just like it just felt like we were ripping the participants off, like walking them at night. You know what I mean? Because some of the stuff it's like, it, like I, I want you to see some of this stuff, and I, the the best way to see for me to explain it is during the day. You know, and mm -hmm. so we that was the, the heavy. So we, we we finished the heavy, and they got to see you know both beaches uh, roughly during the day and then they, they got to actually kind of walk around the drop zones at night. So, it, I mean, it wasn't too bad, you know what I mean? But like the, the next tough, we started at Utah beach and we, and moved, you know, around the St. Mary Glee area. We started Utah beach and it was dark. We started at like 10 o'clock at night, just based off the HTL timeline. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I sat down, like after we ran, you know, we were in the top, we were in the light, we had an after party at, at, at the team house and uh, I talked to participants and I was like, Hey, what do, what do you guys think? Like what's, would you think of all the events and everything? And, and one of the things they said would be like, you know, it'd be a lot better to see a lot more stuff during the day. Like we, we saw, we saw a lot, you know, we, we, and you're able to explain everything, but we really like to see it during the day, you know, daylight hours, you know, and, and, that, and that leads credence to the, you know, the last events we ran in 2019 where we did, you know, we did the star course and then, and then we, you know, had the two tops in, in the light. I mean, it, it was during the day, yeah. you know what I mean? So like they could see everything. It was great. But the star course was was overnight though. Just I mean, because of the lake. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a twenty lake, hour yeah. event, and so you know we started at Utah and it was light, and then we, yeah. it's it's sort of like the opposite of what you're describing, and that's my favorite event that Go Ruck runs, and I don't mean broadly the fifty miler because that's I, I do love the fifty miler, but I mean the fifty miler seventy five k or whatever we do the eighty k in a couple of years at Normandy is, is my favorite. It's a, it's a small team yeah. that we were on. There's other teams and you talk to them throughout the way, but we started at Utah and there was, it was just electric. You know, everybody's there. You're looking at replicas of Higgins boats or not replicas, actually an old Higgins boat, I think. Yeah. And you're there at the beach. Then, you know, you're going through St. Mary Gleese and Carrington. And then you're coming around was the German cemetery the next big? Yeah, the that was, yeah, yeah the that was at dawn. Yeah. That would, you're, you're, you're like, so at sunrise and before dawn, there you start to see the hedgerows, right? And you start thinking about fighting in those. I mean, just yeah. a, everything's ambush alley. I mean, we used to talk yeah. about ambush alley was, oh, I took a wrong turn and I, I got my gun, my fortified gun truck, right? With my yeah. 50 cal <laughs> mounted on yeah. it. And like, oh, ambush alley, we better get out of here, right? I mean, this is just it's, it's ambushes everywhere. And you're just yeah. learning how to deal with that. Cause at some point you got to make your peace with it is, is the eventually what I I'm sure they all had to do. And then, you know, 
the German cemetery with the, the, the contrast to the American cemetery is so stark. Well, yeah, and, absolutely. And, you know, at, at dawn getting there and there's black headstones and you walk around and it's, you see some of the, some of the impactful stuff for me, you see 16 year olds, 17 year olds. Yep. I'm not here to say they were right. I'm just here to say they're 16 and 17 year olds. You yeah, know, absolutely. Th this is just part of it. And you you come around and you look at point to Hawk that the Rangers had to scale up. I mean, you, you're there looking down. It's like, I wouldn't want to do that at, at a, at a training center. Like it's, it, you couldn't learn how to climb on that. I mean, it is, it's just straight down. The idea that there would be a machine gun or someone that could cut a rope and, and there were, and, and your job is to scale that like the Rangers deserve, they deserve the love. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. That point to Hawk. Absolutely. Dan, do you remember in 2019, we had some German participants from yes. the, the Munich Ruck Club and Yep. I remember them sharing some stories that were really impactful. Here we are, you know, this very American centric group of people and reading Band of Brothers and, and seeing it from that side of it. And, and here you have these stories from the other side. And I remember him talking about sort of the shame that these soldiers came back home with. And, and had to live with, you know, it's like yeah. as, as traumatic as it all was for both sides to be in, in these circumstances, it's it, to think about the other side and how they had to deal with, you know, this def crushing defeat and also knowing that the world was viewing them as, as the evil, <laughs> the axis of evil at the time. So, yeah. you know, it was really powerful to hear, to hear that from him and, and to, to consider it. And then, you know, to, actually go and pay respects at, at, at a cemetery of the enemy, you know, and, and yet realizing that they were soldiers just following orders as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and the other thing too, in that area, specifically in that area, you had the OST battalions, and those were conscripts. And Donna D-Day, there's a story about like uh, the guys in 4th Infantry Division, when they stormed Utah Beach, they took some prisoners and they took a couple of South Korean prisoners. <laughs> and like, the Americans were like, well, how did you get here? You know what I mean? And like, and, and the author, it kind of tries to walk the dog. And he's like, well, okay, South Korea uh, during that time was controlled by the Japanese and the Russians fought the Japanese. So the Russians probably took that, or they probably fought for the Japanese. They probably took them prisoner. The Russians took them prisoner. And then the Russians transferred them to, you know, the Eastern Front. And at the Eastern Front, you know, they fought the Germans and the Germans probably captured them and then sent them to the, the Atlantic wall. I mean, that's just wild. If you, if you think about that, like, that would never happen today. You know I mean? It was just a completely different time frame. And, you know, there was a lot of conscripts on that beach and they didn't necessarily believe in, and believe in Nazi Germany and what they stood for, but they didn't have a whole lot of choice in the matter. They had to fight, you know, and that's just the way it is. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those guys were, were killed by us. So Dan, were there any moments that really hit home for you? Oh yeah. 100%. So when we were, uh, and I, I think Emily talked about this, the, the most profound moment I've ever had in my go-ruck ever running an event, ever. I don't think it'll ever be eclipsed was uh, the Omaha Tough in 2019. Me and uh, DS split off and we went and um, linked up with the light class. We started with them. And then we consolidated the light class and the tough class. And we were at the uh, Beerville exit on Omaha Beach. And uh, I was explaining to everybody like, you know, a macro perspective uh, of what went down on that beach because uh, j just during that time frame, the tide it came in. So I couldn't do like my famous sand table with, uh, you know, my knife and my pack of Marlboros and my Copenhagen can and all the other stuff of the, you know, do a train model, you know, North Seek and Arrow, not the scale, the whole nine yards. You know, I, and I was explaining everything that uh, these guys that stormed the beaches at uh, specifically at, at that point at the Beerville exit when I was talking about it. And, uh, you know, we, you know, Rangers lead the way. That's where, you know, the Rangers linked up with the, uh, the, the infantry division there and fought up that, that draw. That, that's when that, uh, that outstanding American, that outstanding soldier, he came down. And, like, he, he – I don't think he was listening to me, but when he came down and we asked him to, like, talk about, like, you know, what he did that day, he almost word for word, like, described almost exactly what I had, had put out to the class. And it was like a validation of like, I'm okay 
to stand here and, and, and talk to these guys, uh, to the participants and tell them. Um, it, it was just so profound to have somebody like that was actually there that actually went through that, talked to the class and, and, and both of our, you know, how I explained it and how he explained it, uh, mirrored each other. And, and it was just a great, there's not too many things going to be eclipsed in my life, you know, as far as running girl work events that, uh, that, that that's ever going to touch. And then obviously being able to talk to that guy and shake his hand, uh, for a couple of minutes and then be in pictures with him, you know, like he's a, you know, he's a hero. Like that, 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 that's, that's a phenomenal American and, uh, should absolutely be grateful for what he did on that day at the beach. And he was so humble too, you know? Yeah. I mean, he was. Well, he's talking about dancing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like the other guy was coming down and we're talking about, he's a dancing fool. <laughs> yeah. like, you, know, you know what I mean? Like, it was just, it was just so awesome. And, yeah. Yeah. His friend had survived Pearl Harbor. Yeah. So as you, I mean, you were in Shock Valley in Afghanistan. Yeah. You, I mean, on your team, your first significant mission, I think your, your second mission and your first significant mission, right? Yeah. And yeah. two of your teammates were awarded the, the Medal of Honor for actions that they took on that day. You, you were there. Yeah. How does it compare? I mean, because both of those guys survived. Ron would later pass of, of something else, lung cancer and, and some other stuff. But, you know, how, how does it compare? to have those guys that are on your team with you're there with world war two veterans that stormed the beaches and here, I mean, how do you compare it if at all, or is it just sort of like, God, I love this country. I mean, these people, I, I, I don't, I don't even think it's even comparable. Um, I think I'm going to go default with uh, God. I love this country. And the, and the fact that I get to serve with outstanding Americans like Matt Williams and the Scott Fords and the Ron Shores and the, the other guys that are on the team. And, and being able to serve with those guys. And then like, you know, you, you talk to a D-Day veteran, it's like they're on the same, I want to say they're on the same plane, but I, I mean, like it's, it's, you know, you, you can see the, the similarities of, uh, of just being a badass, great American, you know what I mean? And being me, myself, just being very humbled and very grateful that, that I've had the opportunity to serve with such outstanding Americans. I mean, how, how do you deal with the, or how do you think about it? Like your, your role now, Sorry, major, right? You're, you're, you're in charge yeah. of a lot of, you're in charge of a lot of the next generation. And, you yeah. know, this is where Rich and I talk about this a lot, just how multi-generational and how oral the culture is in special forces is tribal. You know, you're just passing down, like what's, what's your place in, in this? You know, you talk about, they give you the heritage from the 82nd and, and it's an indoctrination and, and it should be. Yeah, no, you absolutely. should know your your past. Like you should know the the role of the eighty second in in Normandy and all these all these things. And I've I've known you for over a decade now, and I've just I've watched your career. You've gone from being what E six or E seven damn plants to to our major mm -hmm. damn plants in charge of a lot more people. And I don't expect that there'll be uh, American vacations in Shock Valley anytime in, in your lifetime or, <laughs> or anyone's <laughs> lifetime. Right. Yeah. It's just, you know, how yeah. do you, I mean, it's, it's gotta be easy to relate to these guys though, that want to share their experiences or, or is it, or how do you view that? Yeah. So I, I think it, it, rich touch on this, it, you know, the, the spirit of the American fighting soldier, you know what I mean? That, that predated me and it's going to post date me. I, I'm just con continuing on the legacy of that. And, it, it, and one of the things I just, as a leader in this generation, you know, fought the war in terror in Afghanistan specifically, I've always focused on uh, a couple of the lessons that, that were the same in D-Day. One of them I already spoke to, and that's empowerment. I'm a, I'm a big, big fan of empowering soldiers, or uh, the guys underneath me to, to make decisions. And, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's how you're going to learn. Um, and, then, and that's one of the best ways to develop a guy. The next lesson is like, everybody knows the plan. And in D-Day, everybody knew the plan. You know what I mean? So when it was briefed, you know, General Dwight Eisenhower level, he was like, yep, sounds good. That plan just started breaking down all the way down to, you know, the guy on the ground. And that guy on the ground knew his mission. He knew his squad's mission. He knew his platoon's mission, his company, his battalion, his regiment, the division. He knew all those missions and, and what everybody was going to do. So, you know, passing on this, like just having that shared understanding of big picture, like why are we doing this and, and, and what everybody's doing. I mean, that's, that's like the, the, probably the two biggest things that, the, that I try to, among many things, try and pass off to this generation. Um, they were absolutely apparent during D-Day. And then the third thing I, I'm going to go with is, is training. 
And, and Emily, you talked about this with, you know, the, the number of months that these guys trained, years, really. These guys stayed together, especially the, the Band of Brothers, Echo Company 506, Easy Company. Excuse me, not Echo Company, Easy Company. That's my army. That's, that's, that's my regular army coming out, right? Okay? Easy yeah. Company 506, right? So, hey, these, these guys trained their asses off. There was purpose behind what they did. And I try and, and bring that as a leader. Like, and it's absolutely apparent in Special Forces. Everything we do in Special Forces has a purpose. We're not just training to train. We're, we're training because we have a mission and we have a purpose. You know what I mean? And specifically how that relates to the Easy Company, the 506, I mean, they, they knew that they were jumping into Fortress Europe. That was going to happen. So they, they spent all their time just sharpening their knives and, and getting really good at, at, at killing Germans. And they, they were very good at, at what they did. And they trained over and over and over again. They, they trained till they couldn't get it wrong. And th- that's that's something that I, I try and strive into the dudes now, you know, that are below me to, to continue to train, focus on the basics. Dan, you gave a version of what you just said when we were in Normandy at the Omaha Tough. And I found it to be very powerful. And, and I think from based on, you know, what I've read is that that was a big differentiating factor between the two sides. The fact that the Americans, they all knew the plan, like you said, and broken mm-hmm. down. And, you know, they were, they were all had access to the sand tables and they all had the, the past, the code mm-hmm. words and the, the signals. And by comparison, there, there was a lot of hierarchy on the British, or sorry, the German side where they, <laughs> I mean, they got these conscripts and they're not going to like, they're not going to treat them the same way. And it was just this, this different sort of democracy, um, you know, and like you said, when it, when you got down on the battlefield and you're getting shot at, it's like people, oh, leaders rose to the occasion and um, you're taking me back. It was a really powerful moment. And, and to continue on that, I, I really loved when you read Dwight D. Eisenhower's speech that, that yeah. he gave on D-Day and um, Rich has it here. He's going to, he's going to read it. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade towards which we have all striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers-in-arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine the elimination of Nazi tyranny over oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940 and 41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle man-to-man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. The tide has turned. What advantages did we have? What advantages did the good guys have? Oh, we had a few. So currently in the Army right now, we have a a way we go about business. It's called Mission Command, right? It's understanding intent, and trust in a decentralized environment, okay? So the Americans, it, it wasn't necessarily that name, but the Americans absolutely applied that on the battlefields in Normandy at D-Day, all right? And I already talked about the empowerment of uh, those soldiers on the ground, so that was one advantage. Second advantage that they had, that the friendlies had, was that we had complete air superiority over the area. A lot of the, the, uh, the German bombers and the German fighters, they were busy protecting Germany. So that created a vast amount of time and space for our allied bombers to either A, bomb strategic targets on, you know, in France or on the beach or on the continent peninsula, and also get our paratroopers over the peninsula to drop them. The other thing that we had was we owned the seas too. So 
we were able to lock down that, that portion of the English Channel, and we were able to basically unfettered, just completely move the entire amphibious force, the greatest in, amphibious force ever in the history of the world, was able to go from England to the Normandy beaches, and the straight line distance between England and Normandy beaches was actually one of the furthest, if not the farthest to go whenever they picked the D-Day invasions. And the other thing is, is we just had, the, and the same with the English too, you know, just ingenuity on our side. The complex problem was to crack the Atlantic wall and how to do it. And we had folks that were able to like look at these problems and figure out how to solve them. One of them being like armor was the name of the game in, in the beaches. All right. So the idea was get the infantry, secure the beaches, and then be able to move armor onto the beach. Right. So you had, you had these folks like designing floating tanks, which unfortunately didn't work out too well. But at least they had the, you know, the ingenuity and, and they tried, you know what I mean? And you also had guys like, uh, like Higgins, uh, the, the guy from New Orleans that came up with the, came up with the boats. I mean, when Stephen Ambrose interviewed General Eisenhower years after the war, he asked, uh, Stephen Ambrose, like, Hey, did you ever get to meet, um, you know, Higgins? And he was like, no, I never got to meet him. He passed away. And he was like, it's unfortunate. He's the guy that won the war for us. I mean, to have that profound statement come from General Eisenhower. You know, that, that that man was able to win the war for us based off of his design of a boat to carry fighting men from uh, one landing craft to another to get these all these waves of infantry onto the beaches. And I, and I think that, that that's all important. Like all, all of that, you know, is, as far as our advantage, all those things played in our favor and, and, and obviously uh, carried the day for whenever we stormed the beaches. So what does, you know, before we start talking about why we're definitely going to go back for the 80th. <laughs> and I, I told Rich earlier, he's, he's not allowed to die before the 80th. So he's, he's got to get back. <laughs> Hang on. Gotta I'm, I'm going to try real hard. Not to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what does Normandy mean to you? So I, you asked me a long time ago, like what I loved about America and I, and I paused and I was like, all these things are going through my head, you know, and, and the first thing that came to mind was freedom and liberty. And, and what, when I think in Normandy, what, what I think, what, what it means to me is that we had the greatest generation stand up, volunteer to serve, to rid the world of tyranny, and it, it rid the world of Nazi Germany. And that's what it means to me. It's, it's the ultimate symbol of freedom and liberty will always prevail, always. And that, that when I look at the Normandy beaches, that, that's what I think of. I, I think of those free men that stormed the beaches to destroy and get rid of, you know, the authoritarian Nazi German war machine. How does it make you feel? Like, I, I know I don't, I'm, this isn't a show about feelings, but <laughs> it, it, per se, apparently, all, it is. Uh, apparently it is. It's, it's like, what does it put in perspective for you? I mean, cause look, you've had a really successful career and you're still going and rich another really successful, I mean, storied, what, whatever. I don't know how you define that stuff, but you, you did a lot of stuff in service to our nation. You're still doing it. And you go there and what does it do for you to think about your place? You know, we, we've described this over the generations, Rich. It's like kind of cut from the same cloth. It's just they were asked to storm the beaches. Well, I, I think it goes to, to one thing in my mind, and that is it's about people, individuals. When, when you think about, as an example, the, the 506 Easy Company and, and so many more, it wasn't just them. It was the 101st, it was the 82nd. As they flew in, to be dropped the night before D-Day, the airplanes scattered. So all of a sudden, all of those plans of everybody on the drop zone together, assembling, moving to their targets, following their mission, they were totally scattered. And yet each one of them knew. You had guys walking across that peninsula to move to where they knew they were supposed to be, even though they weren't there. Nobody told them to do that. This was an individual thing. And it, it makes me think about a story, and not to get off of that particularly, but a few years ago, I was invited to dinner in Fayetteville, North Carolina, to a French lady's house. She was married to a warrant officer in, in the Army. And I didn't think much about it. Just, okay, fine, nice dinner. She was a good cook. And we started talking. And come to find out, her family came originally from Nice. Her father was in the Maquis. The, the underground resistance movement. 
And the Gestapo got very close because he was a cobbler. So he, he could move around the area, buy leather and so on, and he could pass messages. The Gestapo got very close. And so the family had to leave. And the, the family picked up and went to Normandy near Carentan. And that was a few days before D-Day. <laughs> I had no idea. Oh she's, like, she's like three years old. Mm -hmm. And she remembers this. She remembers the night of that parachute drop. Wow. I don't know if she was if it was a 506 guy, but some soldier, an American paratrooper, stumbled into their barn, probably on Dramamine, because <laughs> yeah. he was really sleepy, and he crashed in the hay, and she was so scared and didn't know what else to do, but she felt safe by curling up next to him in the hay in their barn at their cousin's house and sleeping until the next morning. Wow. That's pretty incredible. You know, it's just, it's these individual stories that come out and, and Ambrose addresses them uh, as he talks about what happened with Easy Company and guys that were, were dropped in different locations, fought with other units and then said, okay, see you later. I'm going back to my unit and, and left and walked back to it. That's the strength. It goes back to what Dan said. Everybody knew what the mission was. You knew what the guy to your right, your left, forward, behind. You knew what everybody around you was supposed to do so that you could fit yourself in regardless of the situation. And it's that Dan addressed it, freedom-loving people, people that understand that there is a mission here bigger than themselves to support the free world. And again, it, it wasn't just Americans either. We're talking Norwegians. Czechoslovakians, Luxembourg, Greece, New Zealand, Australia. Of course, primarily it was British and, and American. And Canadian. And Canadians were there. I mean, there was just a plethora of people from all over the world. Eisenhower said it very succinctly, United Nations. He coined that in his comment to the troops. Mm -hmm. And it was. It was all of these individuals coming together spearheaded in many cases by the Americans, but certainly there were, there were leaders in all levels. And Dan brought it up when he was talking about soldiers. The most important job of any leader is to develop new leaders. And that's the key to the American fighting spirit. You, you worry about the technicalities of war. Is your weapon clean? Do you have ammunition? All of those things that, that have to be taken care of and accounted for. But more importantly, you have to develop and nurture the spirit of the soldier, of the individual. Rich, in preparation for this, you told me about some of the soldiers that are buried in, in the American cemetery. I, I found it really interesting as, as I did some research, and I'd seen some of this before, but I didn't see it, this particular set of, of numbers until today. There's 9,388, I think, buried in the American cemetery total. Ambrose addresses it in Band of Brothers. He talks about the Nyland brothers, and two of them were killed, and they were, they were part of this. There's 45 pairs of brothers buried at Normandy. That's a lot. There's a father and a son. There's an uncle and a nephew, two pairs of cousins. And of that 9,388, there's 307 unknown but to God that are buried there. So when I'm there and it's the end of our events and we're at the American cemetery. My, I, I'm like, this is the most, I, I'm just like, this is the most American place on planet earth. I mean, yeah. this is the absolute best that America represents. It's, it's just, it's on full display here. And so if you're out there, I mean, yeah, we run some events there. Yes. They're awesome. The community makes it great. And you know, you get to kind of be there in a, in a unique way. But regardless, it's like if, whether you go that way or some other way, like go to Normandy. I mean, you need to go and you need to go from Utah to, you need to go see all the places. And, and so, you know, we, we ran a, like, I guess it's an anti-virtual event there this year. We didn't, we didn't send a cadre. We encouraged some of the local groups to get, get together and go do the 50 miler and stuff. We'll be back next year for sure. 2022, 2023, Maybe we should look at doing something in New Orleans, World War II Museum. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that would be a great stateside place to kind of, like, I, I haven't been to that museum yet. Shame on me. No, I've been, been wanting to go too. 
yeah. and I've been to New Orleans. So maybe that's, yeah. maybe that's <laughs> next year or the year after. We'll, look at your schedule. We'll yeah. You know, you know, Jace, you said something earlier about, we don't think that we'll be running events in, in Afghanistan anytime soon, <laughs> maybe not in our lifetime, but but we are able to do it in Normandy. And, and what was so remarkable about. Captain I'm so glad you didn't just disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah. Things aren't looking great, but you know, the, about Normandy though, is I've been there a couple of times, but what I wasn't prepared for, you know, for the 75th anniversary was how many American flags are being flown by, by the local French there it's in the mm -hmm. grocery stores and they're still so grateful the it's 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 embedded in their dna it's passed down to their their children and their grandchildren and i mean it's bringing tears to my eyes just thinking about it it's just it really was special to to see that i mean we we heard it from all of our participants like they would be you know, asked if they could, you know, can I buy you a drink? And, you know, they're sitting there going like, I didn't, I didn't do anything, you know, <laughs> but, but, it, but it was, it's just so touching and the reenactments, mm -hmm. how, how serious people take them. And it's, you know, it's important to remember the past. And the, the other thing too, is like currently the United States military sends a very large contingent over there and drops and, and does jumps over there. I mean, like, I think, <laughs> I've been trying for years to get on this Normandy jump. You know what I mean? Where they, they actually, not necessarily on D-Day, it just depends on how D-Day falls. Paratroopers from the 82nd, from the 173rd, and some of the other units, they'll drop on the drop zones that, that were used during D-Day. You know, I and barely then, missed it. I was in Stuttgart and stationed over there in 2008, uh, and I was like one company over the next company. We, we were doing we, other we, stuff. We saw but, these guys when we were, you yeah. know, walking through the towns. Um, you know, they're they're all set up there. They're having a great time, and you know, the Rangers are there to do the reenactment yep. of of um, Puente Hawk. And you yep. know, it's it's really a special occasion. I think the 80th will be all like that as well. So when we go for the 80th, we're going to the the way this worked at Normandy was the biggest chateaus that were over there, the biggest kind of houses, those are the ones that the Germans would take first, you know, the German officers and all this stuff, yeah. right? Because, you know, they wanted the nice stuff. Well, there's going to be about 25 of us, so we're going to get one of those, right? <laughs> and we're going to take it over, and that's where we're going to be. It's going to be as close to Omaha as possible because that's that's where you want to be. And and then we're just going to be there for, like, at least – at least both weekends, whatever that looks like, but nine, 10 yeah. days, the family's going to be there. The kids are going to be there. The the plants family, the McCarthy family, the rice family, and, and some more. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, it, it's one of those things where I look out at, at the world and there's a lot of places that I would like to go. And there's a lot of neat places out there, new experiences, but Normandy calls and I come, yeah. I'm happy. I'm, I will happily, live the rest of my life and, and not go to those other places for the first time to go back to Normandy when, when, when I can. And I'll, I'll, I want our kids to go when they get, they're young. And then when they're a little bit older and I, I, I think it's really important. I think it's important to, to read a book every once in a while too. I think it's important to study history. I think it's, it's great for perspective. I think we as a society need to champion this. And if you're, if you're in the military, you're, First off, thank you for your service. Second off, go learn from these past battles. Learn what guys were sent to go do. It, it provides a lot of perspective to your place in it because, you know, you know, you and me and Rich and, and M serving in a different capacity, we all had to make peace with our own mortality. And, and yet, I mean, they really had to do it before us. And it puts, yeah. it puts a lot of stuff into perspective. And so I think it's, it's really important that we go there, I think Americans should. I think you should go to Washington D.C. Go, mm -hmm. should go see our nation's capital and go all around and read the stuff and feel it in the marrow of your bones. And then I think you should go cry at Normandy. I, mm -hmm. I think I think that's what you should go do. And you should bring your family and your loved ones. And it's a real honor to get back there. And we've we've had so much fun with you in in the past. Um, you're, you're not welcome without Sandy. Yeah, at, of course. At, at the next one, and and she doesn't yeah. have to jump into a class like she did a couple of years ago yeah. unless she wants to. Yeah. <laughs> and might sweet talk her into it. You never yeah, know. Right. No, but that was pretty cool. That you know, whenever we we had gone there for in 2015, and she was like, she's like, oh, I'll, I'll do the tough. And and to your point, Jason, I mean, she was like, if I want to do one of these, 
And, and for context, you have to understand that, like, she, she knows definitely what all girls is about. She hears about me talk about every event. So she knew what she was getting into. For her, she was like, well, if I'm going to do it tough, I- I'm going to do it on the beaches of Normandy. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and that was pretty awesome. And it was definitely pretty cool to give her her tough patch as the, as the cadre. You know what I mean? And she was a great sport. She did, she did really well during the, uh, the, the event. I'm proud of her. That's awesome. All right. Any, any parting shots? Any saved rounds? One thing I would say, we probably needed to do an event at Tacoa. Mm. That's where it all started for these guys. And I've been there. It's, you can feel the history. Uh, I went up Curahi and, and back down, three miles up, three miles down. And it was, I didn't run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I rucked. But you, you can feel it there. That's, that's where this all started for all of these young men that came together from such diverse backgrounds. Okay, well, we'll put our heads together. I mean, I, I think you could kind of ramp it, and it's kind of like a series. You yeah. Know? A build up. I mean, you could even go to the UK the week before. I don't know. There's lots of, you could do a, yeah. a Jedberg over there. Oh, yeah, we I were mean, talking about a Jedberg. Yeah. There's, there's Jedberg, so much. Yeah. We, we, could, we could look at, at also focusing, trying to bring some of our European friends in and, and talk about, you know, more about gold and Juno and sword. And yeah, put a, absolutely. Because we have so many days over there. I mean, we can kind of flip-flop some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we're just sort of, this is, this is how the magic happens from, from time to time is just sort of spitballing. So yeah. I will share one little event. I've got a piece of Normandy at home. I've got a, a 1938 Luger pistol oh, yeah. in, my, in my gun safe that came off Omaha Beach. Uh, a friend of the family was in the Navy. Uh, I called him Uncle Jack, but he wasn't really an uncle. He was just an old man that I listened a lot to when I was a kid in San Diego. He was in the Navy, and they brought German prisoners out to his ship from Normandy. And one of the prisoners came over and asked for a cigarette. So he gave him a pack of camels. And the guy walked back to his knapsack that he'd brought on board. He'd been screened and everything, but he brought it, went to his knapsack, pulled out this pistol, a beautiful Luger, and gave it to Jack. And Jack gave it to my dad, who gave it to me. Wow. And it's, that's at home right now. It's a pretty that's neat amazing. piece. Just, I, I've got one parting quote from Band of Brothers. It's, those things that are precious are saved only by sacrifice. Dan, thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. It's good to talk about Normandy. It's good to see your awesome face through, you yeah. know, podcast land. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> your, your trips looked awesome. You're, you got beautiful girls in your life. We love Sandy. And uh, like I said, the 80th, you're, you're not invited without her and the girls. Yep, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. 